Um, I was going to preach on, um, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Um, but I really felt led to lift up the question, what reward do you have? And if you, can, if you consider it in its full context, um, it is, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? So let's consider our scripture reading. First comes from Proverbs 25. And I'm going to read it from the screen up there, there. Just a minute. There we go. This is from the wisdom literature of Proverbs 25, 21 to 22. If your enemies are hungry, give them bread to eat. And if they're thirsty, give them water to drink. For you will heap coals of fire on their heads. And the Lord will reward you. Amen. Obviously, somebody's still working it through, right? <laughs> but you know what's interesting? That's exactly what we're going to see biblically in, in our scripture and our sermon this morning is working it through how hard it is, how we need the Lord in order to do what God has asked us to do and what Jesus has asked us to do, which comes to us from Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. And do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles or the pagans do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Yes, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. See, I told you, right? I told you to wait and hear the scripture. Let's have a prayer, shall we? Good and gracious and merciful God, <clears throat> thank you so much for this word to us, though it is hard. It's a hard word. It's a hard question. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit fills us. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Um, help us to continue to work out, God, the sanctifying love and grace that you call us to and you empower us to give away. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I remember I was having a parental moment. <clears throat> it, it happened a couple of years ago. Um, I was doing what I'm often doing when I'm in my house, which is laundry, amen, um, and cleaning and tidying up and sort of this tug of war uh, with a house that just seems absolutely bent on entropy, which is becoming messy and chaotic and I'm wherever for it. So I was dusting and picking up and tidying um, when our, our eldest daughter, Hannah, came in and unsolicited started helping out. So she picked up a rag, she started dusting, um, she started, um, you know, sweeping, and I tell you what, my mama heart was full to bursting at the sheer helpfulness of our offspring, amen? And I thought, yeah, we've done something right, amen? And I told her as much. I said, thank you so much for helping. It's really wonderful. And she smiled at me, and she continued to sweep. And then she paused, and she looked at me, and she said, um, do I get anything for this? And I said, <clears throat> you have heard it said that one may receive an extra layer of allowance for going above and beyond and being unsolicitously helpful. However, I say to you 
that when we help, when we do go above and beyond, we do so because we are a family. You know, it wasn't quite the response that she was really wanting. It wasn't what she was hoping for. And, you know, it reminded me, um, you know, the question was really, what's my reward? And sometimes it's hard um, when you have what you think are established rules, guidelines, regulations. It's difficult when they get essentially reinterpreted or, as one may say, brought to their fuller understanding. You know, and it, it strikes me that perhaps many of the people that were listening to Jesus' teaching um, from the Sermon on the Mount that day, they felt that way. They felt sort of the stretching of Jesus coming to reinterpret what they understood to be truth. Now, Jesus was in chapter 5 in Matthew's Gospel where we heard the Gospel reading. Um, it comes to us from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so Jesus had just called his disciples back in chapter 4, and then he went on this preaching teaching tour around the countryside and he was building a ton of momentum and people were following it started off as sort of smaller crowds and then it kind of you know blossomed into multitudes who were following him and literally this preaching tour had a culmination and it ended up on a geographical high spot as well so uh, right off from the sea of galilee on what matthew's gospel calls the mount but i've been there to the Sea of Galilee, maybe some of you have, it's really a hill overlooking the lake that is the Sea of Galilee. Um, and there Jesus begins to teach. Now we can deduce something from the way in which Jesus taught these crowds. He said, um, you have heard it said, but I say to you, that was the formula. We can deduce that most of his hearers were probably Jewish. Because what Jesus was doing was plucking Old Testament teachings or understandings about the law, and he was reinterpreting them, or as he said by his own admittance, he wasn't there to diminish them or to minimize them or to abolish them, but rather to bring them to fuller understanding. So Jesus went on to say, if you read chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel, he says, you have heard it said, do not murder. And everyone there on the hillside would have gone, yep, that's one of God's top ten. Do not murder. Jesus said, but I say to you, if you hold anger against a brother and sister, you know, if you hold it and kind of fan it, get it going, blow on it, get it really going, you are liable to judgment. So, so Jesus kind of deepened that quite a bit. And then he went on to say, you know, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And they would have said, oh, yeah, that's another top ten. But I say to you, if you look at someone else lustfully, you've already committed adultery with them in their heart. I mean, can you imagine? All those people were like, that is not what it says. They're probably going back and, I beg to differ, Jesus. But Jesus was trying to remind them that the Jewish law was about more than just checking off a morality box, filling, you know, signing your name on the ethical clause, or, and, appearing as though you have it together in the appearance and in the eyes of other people. It was about allowing God to change you from the inside out so that there would be an agreement, a harmony, a congruence between what it is you claim to believe and how you actually lived your life. Because isn't there strength and confidence in that? When there is a sense of harmony about what you believe in your heart, you think about in your mind, and the way you actually live it out in your life. I mean, there, those are some beautiful moments. I say moments because it's hard to get a whole day of that. Amen? But they're beautiful moments. So Jesus came to reinterpret what they thought about faith, which is really what God intended all along. And that's what was going on in the Sermon of the Mount. And so it is from this Jesus reinterpretation that our next question emerges. Now, you know we're in the middle of a worship series, amen? And it's all during the Lenten season, and it's called Ask the Big Questions that Jesus Asks. And we've, we've wrestled a little bit with why do you worry? I hope everyone is still working on that one. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks us, do you want to be made well? And today we consider what reward do you have? And in the fullest expression, in the context, 
If you love those who love you, those people who love you back, what reward do you have? Now, I want to just stop right there, and I want to answer this question. There is a reward when you love well the people who love you back, right? There is an inherent reward in that. When you love on your spouse and you give them an affectionate hug or your significant other and they hug you, squeeze you back with mutual affection or adoration, I mean, there is a reward in that. There is a deep sense of just well-being and gratitude that comes from that kind of reciprocal love and respect. There is, a re there is a reward, there is a buoyancy of spirit that happens in our lives when our children, whether they are four years old, whether they are 34 years old, when they come up to you and say, mom, dad, or grandma, grandpa, thank you so much. Whether it was the graham cracker snack that you just provided, or the college education that you helped pay for, or being there for your child when they were going through an unknown and difficult time. When they express their thankfulness to you as a parent, there is a profound sense of just, wow, of, 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 of peace and of gratitude. You know, there's a reward in that, isn't there? Amen. There is a reward when you spend time with friends you know, these are the folks who've become your family along the way. You know, whether you have your best friend over for a sleepover on a, on a Saturday night, right? Or you reconnect with a college roommate, or you go out to dinner with friends, or you travel a couple states to hang out with each other. There is a reward in having those sort of friendships in our lives, people who love us back. There's a reward in that. There's a reward when you are in the grocery store parking lot and someone's struggling with their groceries and you walk over to them and you help them and they look at you and they're thankful they say thank you you have made my day you get a reward from that that sort of reciprocity you know when i open the door to our house and our dog gives me a full body wag you know that full body wag and she acts like every single day that I am the best thing that has ever happened to her, every day. That there is a reward in having that sort of experience in your life. So Jesus asked the question, what reward do you have if you love people who love you back? There is a reward. I mean, the sort of emotional confidence and the sort of, um, the sort of structures of support that that builds in our lives, it is a reward. But, you know, you can probably generate this kind of love, you know, this kind of affection. You can probably sort of generate that on your own steam. You can, you can probably love people who love you back and treat you with respect and kindness and generosity. You can probably by your own, you know, strength muster up a reciprocal response. But there is something more. There is something more. If we want to walk in the ways of God, if we want to know the depth of forgiveness and mercy that God values, that God finds important, if we want to participate in the sort of peace that God desires for this world, if we want to be a part of the kingdom building that Jesus came to this earth, lived, died, and came back from death in order to testify to and say is possible because, you know, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we want to participate in that, there is another step that is beyond loving those who love us back. And this is the way Jesus puts it. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, love your enemies, 
pray for those who persecute you. If you greet your brothers and sisters, only people with whom you get along with or who love you back, what more are we doing than the others? Apparently, God expects more from God's followers. God expects more from God's followers. Now, loving like this, if we're going to take those words of Jesus to heart and wrestle with them, if we're going to do that, we, we will not be able to do this on our own. Amen? It will, our natural human inclinations will not be enough to generate this kind of love and forgiveness. It can be challenging enough to love people whom we really, really like. Amen? Much less folks who we call enemy or people trying to persecute. That will require supernatural assistance. (laughs) That will require supernatural assistance. You know, and I have to, I wondered, the Bible spends some time talking about who is my neighbor. But I wondered when Jesus said the word enemies there on the, the hillside, I wonder who came to mind for the hearers. Who did they perhaps think was their enemies? Now, as you all know, this is within the Jewish life and culture of first century Palestine. They were living under sort of this somewhat benign dictatorship of the Roman Empire. They were an occupied people. Um, And so I imagine that in their mind, when he said the word enemy, a Roman soldier probably came to mind. They're in in full regalia. Perhaps it was the tax collector who kept taking more than their share so their family had to go hungry a few nights a week. Perhaps it was King Herod. That's who they saw. The local representative, or maybe even the emperor. So I imagine that probably nationally they had some go-tos that came to mind. But you know, I imagine that as Jesus kept on teaching, (laughs) I imagine that some of the more local enemies started to emerge in their mind. You know, that neighbor who planted their forsythia plants right over the property line, amen? And to this day, they have never admitted that they were wrong. The boss who threw them under the bus in front of other colleagues, the school that rejected them, the friend who told their secrets, the spouse that started with a vow and ended with an oath to take it all, the family member whose addiction caused pain, brokenness. You know, it's interesting to consider who makes the enemy list in one's heart and mind. You know, it's interesting, I was just talking to a friend this past week who said, you know, sometimes I am my own (laughs) worst enemy. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Something to think about. There there are even those moments in my life, um, I call them momentary enemies. I don't know if you ever ever had this experience. Um, I did this past week. I was trying to find a parking spot at St. Mary's Hospital. It's a challenge, Amen. And I sat there, and I looked, and I looked, and I drove around, and I drove around. And then I um, put my blinker on, and I waited for this person who was about to leave. And this gentleman, as I was waiting, and I had been waiting, put, I did everything except get out and put a cone in that spot. Amen? <laughs> and he, I, I'll be darned if he didn't whip right in my spot. Amen? I did not wish him well at that moment. That was a, it really was a, a momentary enemy for me. Or the 35 minutes I was on the phone call with that company that was completely giving me the runaround. I did not wish well for them. Now, this is minor. I mean, when you consider the actual levels of infraction that people are experiencing around the world, I realize that's minor, but at the very least, it's practice. I could have spent the 35 minutes praying for the person I was about to talk to. I did not do that. I plotted and schemed. Amen? It is practice, if nothing else, because worse infractions do come our way. Who is on your enemy list? It's an interesting thought. Who's there? 
How'd they get there? You know, and because I was allowing this scripture to kind of marinate in my mind this week, to ruminate, I also held these words of Jesus, love your enemies, pray for those who who persecute you. I held that in my mind as I watched the news, um, as I read social media, as I just went through the week. Um, And I was just starkly reminded about how this teaching and this invitation from Jesus, it is not the cultural tide that we swim in. It's not, I even watched a, I watched a movie, like a suspenseful movie, and the bad guy got it at the end, and I was so glad, right? It just feeds some deep need within us for a sense of justice. Um, but I was reminded about how this is not, this is so at odds with how our culture operates. Um, I was reminded of that when I read a Facebook post by a branch on my family tree that went like this. You mess with me, you're going to feel pain. You mess with my friends, you're going to need an ambulance. You mess with my family and you're going to need a shovel. These are my people, amen? (laughs) And you know what then? I looked down, I was just horrified, and I looked down, like, 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 like. You know, when we, we do like it, we feel justified. It really is the tide that we swim in in our culture. In fact, in the, in the face of harm, many Christians may suddenly become Old Testament devotees, right? And say, well, it says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I was reminded this week, I read a book by Walter Wink called Engaging the Powers. And he's a theologian that just put it into context, and as many of you may know, that that Levitical law was actually a law of restraint to prevent retribution. Because sometimes if, you know, one person acted, a whole village would be destroyed, or one family member stole, and the whole family would be destroyed. So actually, that Levitical teaching was not a hall pass to vigilante justice, but rather it was a limitation. You may only take what has been taken from you. You know, I think that's why Jesus started with that teaching when he reinterpreted what God intended. Because that that idea is so compelling to us, and I think our very base sinful human nature that Jesus had to call us back, and through the Proverbs and through the Gospel, Jesus had to reinterpret then, and Jesus has to come now and today and to continue to reinterpret for us. For you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, but I say to you, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? You know, the Greek word that Jesus uses here for reward, it's mythos in the Greek, And what it means, it's less about money that you earn, and it's more about wages that you receive. So in a sense, Jesus is saying, if you love only those who love you back, what have you really received from me? How have you really relied upon me? You know, you can do that on your own, loving those who love you. But for my mercy, God says, to extend as far as I really want it to go, you are going to need me. You know, I become increasingly convinced as a follower of Christ that this this teaching is really what distinguishes us. This is really what makes us church. This is what will compel people who have given up on religion or Christianity or the church to take a second look. You know, after all, nonprofits can feed people, government programs can clothe, housing programs can provide shelter, but only Christians can love as God loves and through those actions show the love and mercy of Christ. This is really what distinguishes us as Christians, if we give this teaching up, if we dismiss it as impractical, weak, or irrelevant, 
then we close the door on the power of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in our world. You know, Jesus offers us this third way, this third way of the gospel, where we choose forgiveness, we choose to let God be the judge. We're not going to be a doormat by which other people walk all over, a victim, but neither are we going to return hatred for hatred because essentially then we become the enemy. We become that which we detest. But rather, Jesus gives us a third way, and it's the gospel way of forgiveness, and it's strength. Martin Luther King Jr. puts it this way. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. You know, when we sign on um, to be a follower of Jesus, God will consistently come into our lives and reinterpret. Amen? And if, if we listen, God, maybe through the still small voice, is saying to us, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, let my grace and my mercy go as far as I desire it to go and be freed in the process. You know, we... We can hold on tightly to our resentments. We can. We can withhold forgiveness. We can keep score. We can count the record of wrongs. We can seek retribution, and it will feel good for a while. We may even feel justified. We can do all these things. It really is our right. But we just can't call it Christian. Let us pray.